Hello and welcome everyone. Today we're going to look at um, progressive continuous enhanced provision from babies to nursery. So we're going to look from some of our very youngest children up to about the age of three. So my name is Rachel Morlock and you're very welcome to join the session today. We're going to be showing some videos at different points. So it might be handy if you've got a pen or a paper to make a few notes. Obviously, if you want, you can stop the recording at any point um, and re-listen to it. So um, if we start now in terms of going forward. So we're going to think about the provision that needs to be in place, effective provision that needs to be in place for some of our youngest children. So we're going to think about appropriate resourcing, how we develop their knowledge, skills and vocabulary and the role of the adult in supporting learning to enable children to develop. And the thing that I always say to people is that babies are not two-year-olds and two-year-olds are not just mini three-year-olds. So it's not about taking a provision that would be suitable for three and four-year-olds and just saying, well, we'll dumb it down a little bit for our two-year-olds and that'll be okay. And we'll dumb it down a little bit more um, for our younger children and that'll be all right as well. Because actually the needs of those children are really, really different. So if we think about how a two-year-old behaves as, as opposed to a three or four-year-old, for example, they're really impulsive. It's I see it, I want it, I take it. Um, so I'm going to just remove my um, face from the screen just so that you can see all of the slides as we go through. So for me, it's really about meeting the unique needs of each child. And so that's the real importance of relationships and about knowing each child really, really well. And we're going to go through and explore that what that looks like and, and how you might manage to achieve that. So it's a really deliberate consideration of the adults who are going to work with the children, the space that the children are going to have um, and the resources that are going to be in place. And I think that what, what you'll see as we go through the course is that the most important thing for me is about adults. It's about the role of the adults, the relationships that they build up and how those really positive relationships within enabling environments support children to, um, to, to develop really well. So if we think about this taken from development matters and, and um, effective practice, it really talks about the, the central importance of high quality care. So thinking about the child's experience, the individual child, focusing in on the needs of the individual child and really being able to think about the needs of that child, that babies and toddlers and young children thrive when they're loved and well cared for, that um, there needs to be consistency. Every practitioner needs to in, in, enjoy spending time with children. It's really essential um, that um, practitioners are in the age range that really suits well with them. So for example, working, working with a baby of nine months is really different to working um, with a four-year-old. So it's about really, um, celebrating um, the, the, the joy and the wonder of the ages of the children in which you're, you're, you're working. And I think it's about um, managing to be really responsive. It's about understanding that toddlers can sometimes be, they can get frustrated themselves, but they can be frustrating to us when we don't understand what it is they're trying to tell us and they're desperately trying to communicate. But that's all part of that development and them developing their self-regulation as part of that. And um, in the 40s or 50s, um, Eleanor Goldschmidt did some research and um, she did research for many years and, and um, she helped develop um, daycare practice. Um, and um, she published some research in the 90s, which is still really pertinent today and is often quoted and, and used. And she said that um, the baby is the only person who doesn't really understand why they're there in the setting and not at home with the family. And that really strikes a chord with me because when we're looking at some of our very youngest children, um, it will be the first time for many of them that they've been out of the home for an extended period of time, or they've had to make relationships with people who aren't part of their immediate um, family. So if we think about the needs of our youngest children, of our really young children, they need kind, and loving attention. You might have heard it described as um, that that professional care, that professional love. They need to be with adults who really enjoy with being with young children and can really tune into them. As I said before, adults who find them really fascinating um, and engaging. 
Um, and we've got to remember that um, children in the first years of their life make really, really rapid um, development and they're learning to to grow in independence, to feel strong, to, to express their emotions, to explore their emotions in different in, in different contexts. And they're, 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 they're starting to be able to show as they become older and, and move sort of being towards two and to three about being um, able to start to control um, their, their impulses and their behaviours. Um, and they're also growing in terms of independence, in terms of their um, their personal their personal care and their ability to manage that. So we're going to have a look as we go through um, at some different videos. And the first one that we're going to have a look at is this one. If you want to um, take a few notes and reflect on, on, on what you see when you're looking at the video, um, and we will, I'll, I'll discuss it when we come back having watched it. So let's think about what we saw in, 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 in that video and why I chose that one. So what we saw in there, we can see um, there's, there's two um, young children, two young girls. I, they look like they're probably just about two looking at that. What we saw was a really enabling environment. Um, it had um, resources that allowed them to be physical. Um, they, they, they were climbing up, they were sliding down, they were very active learners. Um, we saw that there, there was quite limited um, other resources in, in terms of that and things that were carefully considered. But the most important thing for me that we saw in that room was the practitioner. We saw that professionally caring adult, that professional love. So when the child had achieved something in terms of coming down, they weren't quite sure where they and they ran to the adult um, to have a hug. And what we've got to remember that in terms of a lot of practice, it's about thinking about that attachment theory that underpins practice. And children need to be securely attached um, to, to the adults around them. And that supports their well-being and their pr promotes their happiness and supports their emotional development. And most of the children who, who, who you work with will have a really secure attachment resulting from that resistant, um, responsive, consistent and sensitive care they have and still are continuing to receive. But not all children are as securely attached. And we know that if children um, have a less secure attachment, it's even more critical for them to develop that secure relationship with their key worker in their setting. So the importance that, that going back to babies, toddlers and young children thrive when they're loved and cared for. So the real importance in terms of the role of that key person, particularly with the really youngest children. So reiterating this, for many children, this will be the first relationship that they've had outside of their immediate family. And um, you might be aware of Birth to Five, um, non-statutory guidance produced by the sector. And that talks about the role of the key person in terms of helping the child to feel known, understood, cared about and safe. The key person um, provides a triangle of trust between the child and the family. And children benefit most when the key person has those special qualities and dispositions um, that make them effective practitioners when working with really young children. It's that importance of, um, of as, as I talk about, a, a, about really enjoying being with really young children. 
And if we're thinking um, about those strong bonds, babies and toddlers need to be able to form that really strong bond with their carer and have plenty of focused attention. Um, it's thinking about how they're going to be developing um, feeling strong enough to express a range of emotions. During this time, they're really growing um, in independence. Think about the frustrations that sometimes we see in two-year-olds where they really want to do it themselves. They reject help. Let me do it in terms of that. And as they move, as they move to become older, they start to have more control. They become less impulsive. Um, and um, But they still need a lot of support with, with um, that self-regulation and managing those, those emotions as part of that. So they need a key person who um, really understands how children develop, who is, has time um, to build a really effective relationship with the parents or the carers, who understands the importance of attachment um, and supports the children to make those um, those secure attachments, who can really support the children um, to, to explore and to develop, to realise that, um, you know, that, um, that, that things don't always go in the way they were attended and things don't always work quite as they thought it would do, and how they manage to develop that self-regulation and how they, they, they develop that co-regulation as part of that. So it's really important um, that, that children have the opportunity to build up that key person relationship. We're going to have a look at another video. Now, all the video clips are quite short because, because they, they tend to be short with younger children. We're going to have a look within a daycare setting uh, where this child clearly does have a, 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 a key person, but there's some really effective shared care within this video because obviously their key person steps away. You'll see the response of the child when that happens and you'll then see how, how another practitioner steps in to support that child. I know, it's not happy, Jack. Who was going to take him away? Yeah, so I'm out of here. I'll be right back. I'm coming back soon. <laughs> right, come on then. Uh, so what? Hey, so what's going on? Yeah. Ah, da 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 da. da, da. You just like to throw things, don't you, Chad? Hello. We put the ball inside, ready? Where's the ball gone? Oh, where's the ball gone? Look, where's it gone? There it is. Yeah. So what we saw in, in, in that video was the reassurance that the practitioner gave um, to Jack before before she left. And but we still saw the look, didn't we? When she went, that slight insecurity, what was going to happen? in terms of that but we saw the other members of the team settling in they clearly knew that child as well but they moved in realizing um that he was slightly anxious at that point and provided um that support and reassurance that he needed in terms of that um we're just going to go and have a have a look at this next one as well about the importance of the role of the key practitioner in this video we're looking at um this is a care routine um, and in terms of building those really effective relationships with children, it's about um, every minute and the, the routine things like personal care for a child are really strong one to one opportunities to be able to build up a really effective relationship with a child. And we know from research that children benefit most in terms of their language development from those one to one um, engagements and and dialogue and discussion dialogues with adults. At this point, it, it's um, um, the, the the child isn't at a point of being able to hold a sustained conversation with the adult. Um, but it's the importance of that one to one engagement and realizing that co uh, communication isn't all about speaking. A lot of communication is nonverbal. Sorry, Jack. Jack. Um... 
Right, okay. Right then, and you need to come up now. Hello, Minnie May. Have you had it? You're all done. And I have you had it? She's all done, Jack. Nice clean, baby. You're all right. One button to go. Jack, I've lots of little buttons. And here, all done. Oh, done, my baby boy. Nice clean baby. Jordan. So one of the things that we saw in that video, something we're going to go on and talk about in a minute, we saw the adult providing a commentary for what was happening. So developing that language skills with the child. We saw um, some a really good two-way dialogue. We, we we saw the mimic and copy. We saw, we saw the adult um, mimicking what the child was doing and copying. And we saw the child responding in terms of that. So that really importance in building those relationships, the relationship between the adult and the child. But what we also saw in that was the importance in the conversation in the adult um, in, in starting to develop those really early language skills in children. And you might be aware of this, I'm gonna go through this quite quickly, but there was some research done in America some time ago um, that looked at the language development of children from more deprived um, backgrounds as opposed to other children. And um, the sort of headline from this was that, that children are, are um, some children are exposed to 30 million fewer words by the time they reach schools than others. Now, there's a little bit of caveat about, about this um, research in that it was done in a very particular community um, in America and numerous researchers have tried to replicate it and they haven't managed to replicate it to quite the same level, but they have, um, they have discovered through that research that um, children from poorer communities Tend, do tend to have less exposure to language preschool. Um, and so we know that good language skills are really critical for children's um, futures. And, and um, children, when they're in the reception class, um, do something called an EYFS profile. So it looks at where they are at the end of reception and, and, and has, a, has a broad view across a number of areas about whether they're broadly on track with their learning and where they'd be expected to be. Um, but what they found out was that if children weren't on track at that point, there's still a significant chance that they won't have caught up by the age of 11. And if they haven't caught up by the age of 11, only one in four, uh, only one in 25, so 4% of children who aren't, who, are, who aren't at the expected level at the age of year six, then go on to get a GCSE in English and maths. So actually, outcomes by the end of early years, by the end of the reception class, strongly correlate to outcomes for 11 year olds, which then strongly correlate to outcomes for 16 year olds. And if you don't get secure a GCSE in English and maths, then it limit it, limits your post 16 um, opportunities as well as part of that. So it's really, really important that practitioners focus on the early language development of children. And all of this research was done pre-pandemic. And I think that if we if we speak to um, to practitioners and to teachers and to parents now, they would all say that post-pandemic, the, the, the language gap has, has widened and the challenges facing children are greater in terms of that. 
So um, they talk about that, that, that um, as children go through school, children who start at a better point, the gap between them, them and, the, and those who aren't at such a strong point widens. We don't successfully manage to close that gap as children progress through education. So if they're five months behind at the age of eight, age six, so just as they're starting key stage one, um, they will be more a year and a half behind by the time they get to age 16. So it's really, really important that as practitioners, we focus on that language comprehension. And that's by talking to uh, and listening to children and about really, really promoting that, that early language. And it's really clear that a language rich environment is one in which adults talk with children throughout the day. The more children take part in those conversations and for those really youngest children, it's that kind, that's that conversation that we've just seen during, during that tra that um, changing, that, that two way exchange, the, the, the empathy that was in place in terms of that, the adult mimicking and copying and the child responding. And through that, the child starting to learn about the importance of conversation and the, 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 the speaking or the noise and the response that comes back as part of that. Um, and children who don't have that rich language and they don't have those opportunities to take part in um, those conversations will struggle much more with their with their reading and their writing uh, as they progress through. So um, and, and one of the other things that some of the research shows is that where um, children are exposed to books and stories and, and, and high language um, in their home, then the, the voc their vocabulary um, develops at a greater pace. And um, this is, so reading and writing float on a sea of talk. So actually when we're starting that conversation, those talking and that rich language environment for our really youngest children, we're really supporting them moving forward because children can't learn to read and write until they have that understanding of language. So developing language is a really, really essential part. And it's really important to remember that language is necessary both to talk, um, so, so that spoken conversation, but also going into written communication. And as children move forward um, and become older, it becomes really, really important because if they don't have those language skills, then they can't access the wider curriculum. And in 2021, um, a parliamentary um, group highlighted that the impact of the pandemic is already showing a marked language gap between disadvantaged children and their peers. So it was already there before and there is now this view that the language gap um, is growing um, for younger children. So if we're thinking about those opportunities to really support young children's um, language and those young children uh, and young children's um, comprehension. It's about that exposure to language through conversations, through stories, through not just reading a story to a child, but through sitting there and talking about a book called Dialogic Book Talk. So about looking at what they can see in the pictures and talking about what's in the picture, talking around the story as well as reading the story. And it's that exposure to those, that, to those rhymes, to those nursery rhymes and to those songs are really, really important. So babies learn to, teach, to speak by listening to and repeating sounds made by adults and starting to connect them to meanings. And we saw a little bit of that in the video, didn't we? The, the, the baby was trying to copy the sounds that the adult was, was making and then the adult changed and, and, and copied some of the sounds that the baby was making in terms of that. So in the first two years, um, the development uh, is really, really rapid. And um, so as they start to listen and start to try and repeat those sounds made by adults, they start to understand that certain sounds have certain meanings. But they don't at this stage consciously distinguish between the individual sound units when they're hearing the spoken language. Um, and there's some studies that say that babies... Um, learn um so, some some babies learn by associating um the sound ball or the word ball for example at the site of a round um, bouncy object helps them associate the two um and other research suggests that children can map meaning to a word after experiencing it just once or twice but it's really important that children are exposed to that language and they're exposed to that vocabulary 
And in the first two years of development, um, toddlers' brains focus on the most common sounds in their native language and connect those sounds to, to, to meaning. And as they go through and become, um, uh, as they develop, it's about taking that, that speech and that language and, and then starting to develop the comprehension. But babies begin to communicate from the day they're born. Um, and and um, we're going to have a look at a video now of a six-week-old um, child. Um, they're in a domestic setting with their grandma. Oh, Dad. so that was a really, really young child. And what we saw them was chatting with grandma. So they were cooing and they were taking turns. You saw the, the, the child really focused on the face of the adult and the adult responding. Um, so ch chatting to the baby and he made um, cooing noises. And, and so they were starting that really, really conversational um, turn taking. So he, he was cooing, she was chatting in terms of that. And we know that from birth to three, as children start on, on, on that um, progression, they start by turning towards familiar sounds when they're very young. They can also be really started by loud noises. They become really familiar with the voices um, of the um, familiar people within their homes, so whether that's siblings or whether that's their parents. Um, they really gaze at faces. They're trying to copy facial expressions and movements. So going back to that changing video, we saw the practitioner doing that. Um, as they develop, they start to be able to make eye contact for longer periods. They, they still really closely watch people's faces. They copy what adults do, take it in turns through babbling. Um, they wait for a response when they babble. And um, we know that if we want them to have really secure attachments, the response of that adult back is really, really important. And then as they progress, they try to copy adult speech and lip movements. Um, so they're starting with that really, really early vocabulary and they're starting to make the sounds that they hear and those sounds are moving into being words. So when they're very young, they really enjoy singing and music and, and things that make sounds. Uh, we know that they write to, from being really, really young, children recognize and are calmed by familiar and friendly voices. Um, so it's really, really important that we take those opportunities to um, to respond to children when uh, when they when they're making those early sounds and when they're talking about them, and we know that if we think that that most children learn to speak by exposure, they don't need specific instruction. And research shows that when children are in that language rich environment, when adults are talking to them or when they're hearing their, their siblings talk, that for most children, language will develop. And they start going through a process of um, picking on words that they know. So if, if we might, they, they, they might know the word um, teddy, for example. Um, so if we put the teddy under the table and talk about the teddy being under the table, they know teddy. And then they might start to make the association of table as part of that. It's really, really important that children are encouraged to speak in their home language. It's always the best model for children. If they're learning English as an additional language, it's really, really important message for parents that children need to carry on talking in their home language because it's in their home language. They're going to hear that really rich vocabulary and they're going to hear um, the, the, the sort of grammar um, and, and sentence construction of their home language. So it's really, really important um, that children um, are exposed um, to their home language. So this is from something called Every Child a Talker, which was um, published a few years ago. You can find a copy of it. Um, if you if you look online and it looks at the stages of children developing. And one thing that I always do is think about where would my children who I'm working with fit into this sort of um, uh, where, where would they fit into this? So we saw that it, with the really youngest children, 
um, the noises that they're making um, are because that that they're interpret that it's their need. So we know that when a baby is crying, um, they're crying because they have a need. They might be saying to you, "I'm hungry." They might be saying to you, "I'm too hot." They might be saying to you, "I'm wet." They might be they they might be saying to you, "My familiar adult, my voice is gone." Where are they as part of that? And then as they sort of move forward, we, we, we have children who start to use um, gestures and they're starting on those really early words and starting to link maybe a couple of words together. And then as children um, go through, they sort of start to develop in terms of that they communicate, but they often find it difficult to make uh, us understand what they want. They might struggle a little bit with sentences. The pronunciation of some of those words might not quite be right. And then they're progressing through to children who are starting to use simple sentences to communicate. They start to ask questions, the why questions. Um, I'm sure you can all think about children as they progress through who just ask so many questions. Why, 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 why? How does this work in terms of that? And generally um, the, their, um, their enunciation is improving as part of that. And, and we're able to understand more of what they're saying. And um, as children move through, they become skilled communicators. Um, so, uh, you know, they're, they're using um, uh, appropriate language for their age. So they, 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 whether that's using words, starting to use sentences or being able to tell stories. Um, but there's always some children who are, who are reluctant communicators who need more encouragement. Um, and again, we've already talked about children um, who are learning English as an additional language. They might be really competent in their home language. Um, but but as they move into a daycare setting, they're having to learn to speak in a different language. Um, and, and so, again, they're, they're listening, they're watching, they're trying to make sense of the language that they know in their home language to, to what's being said around them in terms of that. So we saw in um, the first video, one of the strategies that the adult was using where she was talking about what was happening. So she was providing a narrative for the, ch the child. Another thing, another way of doing it is about um, contingent talk. So that's where the parent or the carer talks about objects which are within a, an infant's um, focus of attention. And some research says that infants whose parents um, use contingent talk, so they talk a lot to their children about what's happening, what the child can see, what's going on around them, um, have um, much larger vocabulary uh, as toddlers. So it's going back to that whole idea of children need to be exposed to a lot of language in the very early stages. So we're going to look at um, this video now. Uh, uh, it's clever boy. You stand up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. La la la. La la la. Let's see him. La la la. That's a good one. Yeah. Are you there? Oh, wobbly, wobbly. They're dancing. Dancing, dancing. Yeah. 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 Yeah, he's a clever boy. So we saw in that video what I've just been talking about. So the child was about six months old, I think. They were babbling. We saw how the child minder effectively supported and extended that language, how we saw um, how she was copying what he was saying and then he was copying back. We saw that real start of that two-way conversation that was happening between the the adult and the child and i think what we saw in there was the real the the real care and attention um that the adult was giving to the child in terms of that and the really positive relationship and the affirmation that the child was was receiving through that exchange Amen. and we're going to go straight on and have a look at another one that's the juice oh, that's right you want to touch it one more time before i open it Mm, 
Need your fruit or strawberry? Yeah. Yeah. Cold. It's cold. That's right. Ooh. It's cold. So he wants to touch. I like that you're using your words. Touch. You want to touch? I like a new word. You guys are using touch. Daddy. 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 That's right. No. Do you like the cheese of your sandwich? Amani. The baby at home? Sleeping? Baby sister sleeping? He working construction, that is working. But that is he building a big house for you? But that is Construction. It's construction. They're building a new house next to the nursery. That's right. They're building a new house. There's lots of men there. Yes. Lots of dadas. That's right. They're building a big house. A big house for people to live in. Do you live in a house? Yes, everyone. It might do. That's why I drink it so that I feel better. So what we saw in that video was the children were um, at, a, at, a, at a later stage in terms of their development. They were looking at telegraphic speech. They were they were um, speaking in two words uh, um, generally. And what we saw was at a lunchtime, the children chatting, communicating with the practitioner and with each other. And what we saw in that was a number of different strategies. We saw the practitioner providing a commentary for the children. So talking about um, what was going on. We saw her responding to their interests when we heard the noise of something being built outside and building upon that. We saw her providing very explicit vocabulary um, for them to extend it, talking about it's being cold. We saw a lot of contingent talk where she was talking about what, what the, the children could see and what was happening in terms of that. So in, in and we saw her again being highly responsive um, to, to the needs of the children in, in that session. So, touched on this a little bit, but it's that importance of back and forward com conversations, whether that's a, a verbal conversation or whether it's going back to that very early video we saw about the babbling with children. So, it's really important that in terms of the role of the practitioner that they can support children um, to, to understand about conversations, back and forward, uh, forth interactions from an early age are the real foundations for language. Um, development and the number and quality of those exchanges which children have with adults during the day really matters um, and so by commenting on what children are interested in or doing an echoing back and adding in the new vocabulary the practitioner will really build children's language effectively and ideally particularly as we're moving for um towards older children, we should be trying to get four exchanges. So trying to get um, adult and child speaking so it becomes a, 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 a two-way exchange with a number of different um, explanations as part of that. But it's really important that in those conversations, we're supporting children to be able to articulate their ideas. And what we also saw in that video was when one of the children didn't quite get it right, the adult didn't leap in to correct them, they rephrased it in their own sentence. Um, to, to, so, so the child was hearing the right model of it, but they weren't being picked up um, where it wasn't quite right in terms of that. 
So a real importance in terms of that adult, in terms of that role of those high quality interactions. So that contingent talk, noticing what a child's interested in and talking to them about it um, and about providing a commentary for what children are doing. And uh, there's a lot of contingent talk is particularly key for children within the age of about nine to 18 months. So talking about what it is um, that they're seeing about giving that language and I'm talking about what it is that's important to them. So it, going back to another example, it might be about talking, you know, they might have their teddy. So it's about talking about giving, giving the teddy, giving the teddy a cuddle, extending their language and their conversation, putting the table, the teddy on the table. Um, and all talk is, is, is useful for children. Um, and children have to make a real sense of our language because there's so much that's really confusing. So they're learning this vocabulary and then they understand it can have a different meaning as they go on. So things like orange or pear or drive are all words that have different meanings in different contexts. So they have to learn to make sense of that and understand that a word they've learned in one context might need something completely different. Um, the blue spot in the corner is actually an Ikea carpet. Um, and the reason that I put that on was to remind me, one of the two-year-old provisions, that's two to three-year-old provision um, that, that I work with, um, they have um, coloured zones, if you want. So there's coloured carpets and they really focus in on small adult, small group adult time, because we know from um, different research that um, the larger the group size the less two-way interaction takes place. So the best interaction takes place when it's one-to-one -one between an adult and child. And, and as the number of children increases, the quality of that interaction and the amount of language um, or the opportunities for children to use language in the same way decreases as part of that. So this particular setting has a round carpets and the children are in really small key worker groups. And at different times during the day, the children know to go to those carpets as part of their routine. They're encouraged to and they, they really focus in on um, storytelling, sharing books in small groups and on that language development. So they plan for that within every single day that children are going to have really short periods of that really quality language intervention that's coming from an adult. So it might be it might be storytelling. It might be telling about a book. It might be starting to sing some songs and joining in. But they think really consciously about the language that they want to develop within those sessions. And it's really important when we're thinking about that, about how do we design spaces and routines that promote talk? Have we got a sofa where an adult can sit next to a child, a comfortable space that an adult can sit alongside one or more children to share books with them? Have we really thought about are there spaces that are really quiet where adults can be with children um, to have those exchanges? Or are all the spaces really, really noisy in terms of that? and the importance of using those routines of the day as well. So thinking about how things like, we, we saw the nappy changing and those opportunities for um, for talk, but things like washing hands or getting, getting um, lunch out or lunch times or preparing things with children are really good opportunities to talk to children and to keep that language going because we know um, looking right back to birth onwards, children want to interact with us. So they interact through words, through body language and through facial expressions. So it's really important in terms of how we respond, how we smile, how we respond um, to, to, to what they're saying and how we support them um, with their language development. So a really important thing to think about is thinking about the kinds of interactions that you have with children across the day, not just those spoken interactions, but right from the very first minute when the child comes into your setting and, and how you greet them and that smile that, the, that, that they get when they arrive and that time to, to have that individual exchange, that individual interaction with each child right from the minute um, that that they take that that they arrive, and if you find when you reflect on this that that you don't have as many interactions as you would want, think really carefully about um, you know what could you do to make it different to allow more time to have those quality interactions. So we're going on to think about another one um, of the areas of effective practice, and that's partnership with parents. It's really really important. Um, that parents are part of that relationship 
the child, the setting, the child, the key worker and the and the parent in terms of that. So that importance of a transition in about understanding, having time to have those conversations with um, with the parent to find out more about the child, about asking those questions about the early that er, those early childhood experiences. Um, you know, if, if, if they're slightly older, about when did they learn to talk? When, when, when were they toilet trained? Um, you know, were there any complications um, uh, when they were born? Who are the key adults in their family? Who is it they have relationships in terms of that in their family and really developing that understanding of the family? And I think it's um, including listening regularly to parents and giving parents clear information about their children, their, their, their children's progress and about making sure that information is meaningful. And I always tell the story. My daughter's 30 now, but my daughter was in a, a fantastic daycare setting when she was about three just before three and um, my daughter was obsessed with tigers from about the age of one to about the age of three and a half and um, we had tiger everything she had tiger pajamas she had tiger bedding she had a little tiger border in her room and every night she had a tiger pot a wooden tiger pot that she used to put her most precious thing whatever that was in, in, in at the time and slam down the tiger lid and i remember going to um, get getting a report from from, from this setting um and it it had a massive tick list of all the animals that that the, that that um, my daughter apparently knew about at this age, and um, and uh, there were three that weren't ticked, one of which was a tiger. But did I need to know that? That wasn't the important thing. Someone had spent a lot of time, try, presumably, trying to find out which animals she knew as part of that. But that's not the most important thing. Assessment isn't about making lots and lots of tick lists about children. It's about having that really good understanding of child development and having those milestone points um, that allow you to check in whether the child's progressing um, and remembering that children don't make straight line linear um, progression. Um, for some of them, it's a little bit of a maze, a little bit of a spider's web in terms of that. And they can be they, they can be much more advanced um, in one area it, that, than in another. And about having something that supports you with that child development, whether it's development matters or whether it's something else, but about understanding that child development so that actually you can support parents with. So you understand what's the next step for you in the setting, but you can support parents with that as well. And the other story that I always tell to parents when 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 they're worried is that I have two children. Um, my first child walked at nine months and my second child walked at 15 months. And they're both now adults. And I can absolutely say it didn't make any difference um, to how they progressed and went for uh, made forward. Children are just different and children progress at different rates. And so it's a really key part about that. I think about part of that partnership with parents, about being able to have those honest um dialogues with parents video in is because what we saw in that video was parents are so important um to to young children and what we saw within that video was the practitioner really recognizing the importance of family to that child and about talking about that child to their family about providing that reassurance um that um a, a, to, to the child as part of that, but the importance of recognizing that the, the how key 
um, family are to really young children. And that's just as important part of that partnership with parents about recognising the importance of parents in the life of a young child. So we're going to go on and have a look at an age appropriate curriculum for young children. Um, and it's really important that we, um, we, we focus in on what's age appropriate um, for children. So in terms of EYFS, EYFS, we're really going to be focusing on those prime areas, communication and language, personal, social and emotional development and the physical development. Children are progressing really, really quickly um, at this age. So it's really important um, that um, as practitioners, we understand um, how children are, are developing in the next stages in their learning. Um, and so if we're then thinking about how we want children to learn, it's the real importance with the youngest children about the characteristics of effective teaching and learning. What we saw when we saw the two girls um, in one of the earlier videos on the climbing is that importance of playing and exploring, children investigating and having a go, children being really, really active learners. One of the most important things I think at this, at this stage is about space. Children need, need space to be able to move. They need challenges to be able to, safe challenges to be able to climb. They need to be able to explore. They need to take safe risks and they need to fail at that and they need to have another go as part of that but that real focus on active learning and, and supporting children to build their concentration um, and when they encounter those difficulties to, to, to build that resilience and to carry on and have another go and at this age children are really um, starting to develop their ideas they're making links between ideas, but those links aren't necessarily secure. And as they go on, they will start to make more links um, between um, what they're exploring. So we're going to, um, so for me, an age appropriate curriculum is about positive relationships and about having um, enabling environments for children. And um, community play things, um, which obviously are, are a furniture provider, but actually their website's really good in terms of lots of um, resources and research and papers to read. And they're really interesting in terms of that. And they talk about um, the importance of having an environment that supports play that's dependable and flexible. And they think about a place to be active, a place to relax, a place for tactile exploration and a place for imagination. And that thinking about young children's learning is often driven by their interests, the importance of having flexible plans and recognising what I talked about. It's not that straight line trajectory of learning um, and getting that depth in learning is really, really important. Um, and around the age of two, a child can understand many more words than they can say. So they can probably um, understand sort of two to five hundred words, but they can't say all of those words yet um, at this point. And if you think also about how young children learn, um, um, if we're thinking about schema, young children will have particular ways when they're when they're engaged in this active learning. Um, so they may want to um, be throwing items or physical. They might be, uh, you know, some children will be wrapping themselves in blankets or enveloping as part of that, putting notes in envelopes to post. Some want to um, look at enclosure, filling an empty air, empty containers, climbing into boxes, making dens transporting my own daughter was it was a transporter she used to put every objects into small bags and carry them around and she would have bags inside bags inside bags um you know and, and those children might be pushing other children and then thinking about children who are really fascinated with rotation and rolling and being spun and playing playing with wheeled toys so you really need to think about how the children you're working with will learn and um, this was a quote from um, the, one, one of the sort of pioneers in terms of um, Margaret Macmillan. And she said, we're trying to create an environment in which learning will be almost inevitable. So we need to think about um, the resources that we're providing um, and the furniture that we've got. So I, I sort of made myself a quick put everything out list in terms of that. 
Um, flooring is really, really important. Um, the flooring needs to be comfortable for children, but there also needs to be space. If a space is cluttered with furniture, children can't run. They can't. Um, they 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 can't. Um, you know, e explore what it's like to 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 move in different ways. Young children need space to crawl. They need space to be able to pull themselves up. The height of furniture is really, really important, particularly when children are at that cruising stage. Are there things that where they can pull themselves up and work around or and walk around we need to think about space for for sleeping um and um lots of settings do this in different ways i tried to find a photo and i couldn't find it of a setting i did some work with many years ago um where the children used to they had baskets effectively on the floor and the children would choose when they wanted to go to sleep and they would they would crawl into their basket and they would go to sleep in their in their in their sort of uh, two year old provision um, in, in terms of that, it, you know, it might be that, um, you know, people manage sleep, sleeping in, in different ways, but it's understanding that children need quiet space about thinking about the space for changing and how that not only gives dignity to children, but also gives those real opportunities for that interaction about thinking about furniture and dividers and storage and the importance also about thinking about the routines of the day. Um, very young children um, start to know what's going to happen and that one thing happens after another and of course we can give them visual timetables we can give them prompts we can give them photographs and talk about it but actually children start to understand those routines of those days really quickly so they might know that after lunch we all go out and play in the garden as part of that so they pick up those really quickly and then thinking about the resourcing that we want to have with children. And one of the things that, that, that I always think about that is that actually we can eat, have too much. So when we're thinking with really young children, it's about having enough um, to allow them to play alongside each other and not necessarily together. So we know that children will often want to play the same resources and when they're little, but they won't want to share with somebody else as part of that. But thinking about how children play. So there's a really strong focus in the, uh, with, with younger children, obviously, on sensory exploration. We're going to have a look at some of that in a minute. Um, but they, they will they will be that adult led and modelled play, that solitary play where they're playing alone. They might play in pairs, but they might be playing alongside each other. They might might then start to play with another child uh, or, or in small groups, playing alongside and not to get uh, not together and then moving as they become older into that sort of collaborative and shared play. So it's really important that we have enough resources to recognise that children won't necessarily share and they might be playing a, 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 a game that that look similar, but they'll be playing alongside each other rather than playing together. So really thinking uh, about that resourcing, but you can definitely have too much resourcing with younger children and it become become confusing um, for them. Um, heuristic play, really multi-sensory play. I've put a couple of links to a really good article in terms of that, but opportunities to explore through looking, listening, smelling, touching and tasting. And we're going to have a look at a video for that.
The video actually goes on for about 10 minutes. It's a really young child. So um, again, Eleanor Goldschmeid talks about heuristic play. Um, so it's offering um, a group of children for a defined period of time uh, in a controlled environment, a number of objects with which they can play freely without adult intervention. Um, it's really important that it's at a time when a child is um, alert and awake. It's supervised by an adult, but not led by an adult. This, this is a treasure basket. You might have heard of those in terms of that. They're generally for non-mobile children, so from six months to crawling. And it's the child ex exploring through looking, licking, smelling and touching, banging, picking up, dropping, crunching, feeling in terms of that. So it's adult supported. It's not resources that children are, are accessing on their own. Children aren't to be left alone as part of that, but it's an opportunity for a, ch for a child to explore. And what we see in this video, and I'm just gonna show you a tiny bit of another one as we go on, is that the, the, the length of time in which the child is engaged in exploring um, these objects. So we're just gonna have a look at this. So, so this, is, this is the quote from, from Eleanor Goldstein. So she said that um, she, um, she, she noticed babies in cots were closed off and they reached out for objects when she, gave, when she passed it to them and they managed to pick them up with caution. And so she developed the idea of treasure baskets, play materials as part of the everyday routine for children. We're just gonna have a really quick look at this next video. We're gonna move quite, quite a way forward to start the playing. Um, so this one's interesting in terms of that it, it there's an older child in this video as well, and the adult manages both children as part of that. So I'm just gonna move it forward as we go through to about here. Watch him. That's funny noise, isn't it? Bring in the cone. Oh, oh there he goes. Oh. Oh, no, he's all right. He's just reaching for the. <laughs> You're all right. What do you got there? What do you want? Oh. You want the brush? Oh. Let him... Yeah, let him have a try himself first. What do you mean? No, it's all right. Yeah. Alright, I'm going to see what he can get. He's got his arms different than he's used to working with his eyes. Yeah. If you move your arm, Jason, you can do it, that's it. Move your arm out. Yeah, there. There he is, isn't he? He's working. So what we see in that one, I suppose, is what we've been talking about all the way through. The care of the adult, the value of those of those really strong relationships, the support that she gave him. She wasn't doing it for him. She was just giving him enough support. She was giving encouragement in terms of that and reassurance. She was using the language about talking about the brush and what it might be that he was wanting. Um, and we also saw in that video the, the, the physical and, and the determination of, of the child um, to, to reach the resource that he wanted in terms of that. So the real resilience starting to build in terms of that. I've just put on this slide a few of the examples of things that you could look at if you were putting them in treasure baskets, but reiterating in terms of that, thinking about the um, about colour, size, smell, texture and shape. But these are not resources that children will be left alone with. They are resources to be used um, with adults in terms of that. So thinking about having ideally a, a, a low stable sided baskets so the child can access it without tipping everything up. Nothing small enough to swallow or have sharp edges and it's very much used under adult um, supervision. So we're going to have a look at some of the other areas of provision. These are photographs from a two-year-old provision and they don't match up in terms of the um, the, the, the things on them, but they, they're just examples from a two-year-old provision as we go through. So we're going to have a quick look at um, a, a two-year-old outside. Jennifer, Evan, Evan, what to do with carefully for your friends to get hurt. Let's turn on them up into a big, big building. We'll just put them in gently, Evan, yeah? Just gently. Pile them up, just gently. Just gently, just drop it in. Drop it in. <gasps> wow, that's a big noise, isn't it? Just gently. Yeah. 
some flyers. They're watching. Ready? It's a big one. Watch, watch all these little stones. Oh! <laughs> What? Ready, watch your fingers. Oh, oh, look, it's made a big circle shape. Ready. You're watching. Oh, oh. Right, you're watching. Look at this big one. It's very heavy. Two hands. That one's very heavy. Two hands. Ready. Oh. Jumping up. Whoa, did you spin, see that one spin round and round? So what we saw in that video was, again, we saw that um, a really skilled adult working with the child we saw that at the beginning of the video he was he was throwing and the instinct it would have been saying no no don't do that but she didn't she modeled to him what was expected she was really supporting him in developing that that self-regulation she um she showed to him turn taking so they were actually taking turns one after another as part of that, she modeled language for him about um, circle and heavy and big. And then she talked to him about two hands and you saw him echo back that language of two hands in terms of her. But it was a really sensitive um, in interaction in terms of how she managed to, um, to take that from the point at which he was throwing it into a point in where they were engaged in a highly collaborative um, learning activity together. And one of the nice things about that, I think, was the noise in it. Children love or well, most children love noise and that's another um sort of that 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 sound aspect um of of that activity and the importance of home role play um for me we have non-negotiables in terms of provision and right from the very um earliest youngest children for me it would be a home role play all children have some home experience and so they have some language um, linking to that. So we're going to look at a couple of videos about home role play. The first one is a child who um, who has some um, additional needs and she's developing um, signing and, and, and gestures. Washing machine. I think it goes into housing. Yeah. Housing. Which one will you choose? Oh, one, two, three. Yeah, ice, ice. Please. Oh, sleeping. Sleeping. Thank you, sleeping. Shh. Sleeping. Well, 
So we saw how um, she was modelling the language and the gestures for the child and how the child at the end re repeated the, the, the sleeping back to her in terms of that. And um, building upon that, that home experience and those domestic experiences of children and home role play can be really powerful in, in, in terms of that because it allows children to... Um, to, to build upon the experiences they already have to recreate those things that they will have seen in their own home and in the next one we're going to have a look at feeding a, um, a baby and um children love baby dolls <laughs> Um, if you looked, he he was mimicking what he knew, what he knew from the experience of how he'd been cared for, um, how he very carefully made sure that the, um, I think it was a Cheerio, was going into the mouth of the baby, taking time in terms of that again, sort of, uh, uh, and um, uh, feeding himself at the same time as part of that and starting to show consideration um, for the needs of um, the, the doll in, in this case as part of that as he was feeding, taking turns feeding himself and feeding the doll as part of that. And a really important thing is that if you have dolls or baby dolls as part of your provision, again, is to think with younger children who, who will want a resource to themselves about whether there's enough to enable them to, to do that. And um, the importance of messy play, we're going to have a look at some, some messy play. You want some more, Lena? 
So, um, very young children in, in, in that video, what strikes me is in, in terms of that, they have a real chance to explore with their senses, to, to touch and to taste as part of that. Really um, sensitive support that was slightly different for each of the child. So the child who was the main focus of the video, we saw the way the adult was sitting behind them, was enabling them to, to, to stay upright um, because they, they were slightly wobbly in terms of that. We saw the other child who was much more independent, but we also saw as soon as that child started to make a noise and express that they maybe weren't quite so happy about anything, we saw the adult stepping in to support them as part of that. And I think one of the key, key roles of an adult as, as children grow and develop is about knowing just how much to support to give them and, and how much to enable them to develop that, that independence and knowing exactly when to step in. And that's the role of, of, of a really um, of an adult who's really tuned in um, to, to the needs of the child. And so that comes back to that importance of having those really, really positive relationships with the children who are in your care. Um, Opportunities for mark, mark making. Um, I did explain the pictures didn't match up very well. Um, this one does to a certain extent in that it's got, um, in, in terms of how children develop their mark making and their physical muscle control, it starts from the core, from the center and works out. Um, and so actually for young children, it's much more easy to mark make um, or to make um, or, or to use, say, using um, a, a pen or something like that, or a big chunky pen as they become older. It's much more easy to do it if it's up um, against um, a surface, so, so against a wall or on a board like this, rather than flat and on a table. And if you have a go yourself, you do absolutely feel it. If, if you get a pen and first of all, try writing against a piece of paper on a wall and then try writing on a table, you'll feel yourself that you're using different muscles in your hand and your arm when you do that. So in terms of that development, it's easier for children. Um, and so we want to give them lots of opportunities to, to make big marks. Um, so we're going to start them with mark making in um, in non-standard ways. We're going to look at a video of um, mark making, some mark making in sand in terms of that. But also they understand that their actions result in a change. So, so in that mark being made. The reason I put the other video on was the importance of space. And you can see in, in, in that there is a lot of space and there's some resources there that support physical development that they can get out. But, but it's very much that less is more approach. How did you get it? I can't do that. Press the button. Press the button. Oh, you can write your name in it. You can write this, sir. Let me know. It's Stephen. You need to write Philip. And put Prince Philip. Philip. Put it on. Yeah, you see off his now. Isn't that good? Hi, mate. Oh, can you make your footprint in the sand? Stephen? 
so what we saw in that video is that the the, the the children were making different marks, actually. They were at different stages in terms of their development. The practitioner had written his name in the floor, and so he was telling them that marks car carry meaning. And they not only made the marks, but but they but they managed to rub them out as part of that. And making marks in sand can, can be really helpful. Making marks in wet sand can be brilliant as well. Um, and then different opportunities to really think about that sensory play, that messy play, and those opportunities to make mark, whether, whether it's right. Rolling a, rolling a ball in, in, in a paint um, tray or um, using foam or opportunities for children to mark make that don't before the point at which they're able to pick up a pencil or a pen or a giant chalk as part of that. Because actually you need to have some really good um, fight or starting on the fine motor to be able to pick up or even hold a pencil in order to be able to make a mark um, as part of that. And then opportunities as well, starting with really chunky resources and moving forward in terms of that. So as we go through the progression, we will find that if we're thinking about something like cards, for example, we would have bigger, chunkier cards with younger children um, and potentially move, move to smaller as they go through and their fine motor control and their, their grasp as part of that. Um, becomes more refined. Um, the importance of books. I think I've talked. I talked earlier about the importance of first of all having a space where adults can sit with children to share a book. About having books that are age appropriate. About recognizing that babies will chew and suck books as much as they will look at what's in them about recognising that books bring to children an experience beyond what they immediately know, about realising that talking about a book with young children is as important as, as, as telling the story, about getting them to concentrate in and look for tiny little things. Where's the chick hidden? What can you see in this, in, in this picture here? Um, it's a really... It can be a, a really good time for building um, relationships um, and to, in, in terms of really getting to know the children. So we're going to have a look at a video of quite a young child with a book. Oh, 
So what we saw in that video is young children who are really familiar with how books work because they have stories shared with them and told to them a lot. We saw um, resources that were really easily accessible in the provision, including books. We saw the child who, when they chose and uh, chose a book and took it to an adult, they knew that adult was going to share that book and read that book to them because that's what happens as part of their everyday routines about that. We saw adults who were not only reading the story, but who were talking around the book um, and developing that language. We saw questioning about what might have happened um, to try to get the children into starting about that critical thinking. And then the adult providing um, some suggestions of their own um, for the child. We saw that um the um we saw the children both of them actually um we saw them telling the story themselves although they weren't at a point where they had language or that language themselves we saw particularly with the second child when she was clearly going through that book and pointing at that picture as she flipped over the pages in a way that she'd seen an adult do many many times so they understood that books start at the beginning and work their way through in terms of that they understood that adults will point to pictures and ask them about that and so she was already telling um telling the story herself and starting to copy and mimic what she'd seen adults before so i can't overstress the importance of having that a language rich environment isn't about having labels stuck everywhere it's about having adults who have time to talk to children and who have time to share stories with children and who have time to show a real interest in children and we saw with those children that how much a part of their familiar routine that was because they were really really confident with that we're going to have a little look at some ways um, ch children playing in different ways as they as they move forward. I've got this picture because another one, I obviously have far too many non-negotiables in, in, in terms of my setting, but another one would always be a really large doll's house. Um, so going back to that idea of the role play and the home experiences, but also having a doll's 
house ideally for me it would be open-sided that could be accessed on four sides so children can do some can do that start to move into that store that telling that using the characters if you want to start to talk themselves bringing in that language they know and familiar with from home and extending that language through talking to children So one of the things that strikes me as interesting in, in that video is because when I first started working, I thought, oh, it's going to be a parallel play video, as in the children were playing alongside each other, but not interacting. And they did have the same resources. Um, so we went back about talking about the importance of having enough resources. And they did start off, they were playing with the same resources, but alongside each other. But then we saw them really starting to respond to each other. So we saw the, the, the shaking of the head, the copying of each other, the copying of the child who is just slightly ahead of you. So we talk about how children learn from the from adults. They learn from the environment, but they also learn a significant amount from the peers, from the other children who are there within the setting. We saw that when they got into the the kissing the baby, there was a although there was very um, limited language in terms of what they were doing, as expected with their age, they were they were taking it in turns to kiss the baby. They were watching what each other was doing in terms of that. Um, and they were really responding and they were in that two way um, dialogue with each other, even though um, they were um, they, they were not um, they were not playing together with the same set of resources. And one of the things that strikes me is the role of the adult in that. And the first response would be, well, there wasn't an adult in that. 
but there was. Um, so first of all, it was the adult who designed the environment of the adult who decided the resources. And I imagine it was the adult who had modeled to them many, many, many times before how to look after and care for, for the babies and had modeled the kissing and putting the baby in the pram. But also there was the point at which the child bumped her head and she looked over. So she was clearly looking towards an adult, but she was OK. She sorted it out herself. She decided she was OK. And so the, the the adult role in that was was just as crucial in that they didn't rush in. They allowed the child time to work it out for themselves and to work out whether they were hurt to such an extent that they needed that help or whether it, it was a bump as it was, a little bump that they could cope with and they could self-regulate themselves in terms of that. Um. We're going to have another look one looking about collaborative play. Um, often with younger children, you need to um, the reason that I've put the paper out on the table with the 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 the, the um aprons already there is sometimes with younger children, they do need what you might call an invitation to play. So they do need the resources put out or presented in an attractive way for them because they won't necessarily, particularly if they're unfamiliar with them, they won't necessarily have those independent skills yet of being able to go out and choose their own resources. So as we move into thinking about three and four year olds, we'd want them to be able to independently um, select their resources. And we saw with the babies in the books, they can start to, to select their own resources, but also some children really benefit from an invitation to play, whether that means we put the giant digger in the middle of the sand, so they walk in and see the digger already there and they have an idea about what to do with that, or, um, you know, something like that can, can be helpful for some children in, in terms of enticing them into an activity, particularly because when they're, when they're not um, particularly familiar with it. So we're going to have a look at some, some collaborative play now. Um, I think that video is really interesting. There is very little speech in that video, but there is a massive amount of communication. And um, the children are engaged in critical thinking. They've got a problem. The little boy's legs aren't long enough to reach the pedals, I don't think, or he doesn't know how, how to pedal. Um, but through through their communication, through their thinking together, they enable each other to succeed as part of that. Um, and if we look at what they're doing, they take it in turns, they get off to push and, and they enable each other to uh, in uh, each other to succeed. And again, um, no adult within that, but we can see them looking over towards the adult for that reassurance. So they're taking turns at pushing and pulling um, their friend. 
And that kind of vehicle that enables that collaboration for me is really important. Um, I think most uh, most practitioners would say that the bikes and trikes are the biggest area of conflict in, 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 in a lot of settings. But actually, when we have that collaborative kind of vehicle, whether it's for two or three or even more children, it really promotes that working together and, and, and that collaboration within it. And I think that what they managed to, to achieve with virtually no um, spoken communication in that is, um, is very impressive. And um, we're gonna have a look at some adult supported play. Are you going for a ride here? Oh, here come the police again, patrolling the street. Let's go. Is everything okay? Is everything okay? Yeah, okay. So, we'll see you later. Oh, red light. We need to stop at the traffic light. This way. The traffic light is red. Stop. Okay, green again. You can go. Oh, right. I think I'm really hungry now. I'm going to stop at the restaurant right here and have something to eat. Oh, look. That's green. Yellow. Red. Right. I'm going to change now. I'm going to get my motorcycle here. Where are you going, Jack? Oh, you're oh, you're going to the church. All right, come on, Yeah, should we go to the church now? Yeah. All right, I'm going to here. We'll go inside the church. All right. Yeah. I don't cycle now. First, I try to find out the road rather than parking in No, no. Do you like to go outside, Jack? I'm in here. Oh, another traffic light. Is it green or red, Jack? What color is the traffic light now? Right. It's red. I need to stop because it's good. Oh, all right. Okay, green again. There we go. Oh, 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 oh. I'm going to turn this way now. Going around. Oh, no, I can't go this way. I need to go this way. Oh, Click to go and find. Where are you going? I'll take my quads now. I'll go around again. Oh. Red light again. I need to stop. Look, red light. Green light, off we go. Where are you going now? Are you off to the hospital? Yes, you're going to find your friend. Oh, look, the helicopter is landing on the hospital. I'm going. What I found interesting about that video, so it's um, an adult and a child um, using the same resources. And when they start off, they are um, they are playing separately almost on, on the same carpet. And then where do you start to watch it? You start to think, oh, hang on a minute. The adult's taking over a little bit here. But when you watch it through, what you see as you, as you look at it at different points, both the adult and the child are leading. So at some points, the child's leading and the adult's responding. And at other points, the adult's leading and the child's responding. And when it finishes at almost the same point it started, which is really interesting. And so the adult is modeling language. They're talking about what they can see. They're thinking out loud if you want. 
um, they think that they're um, thinking that they're explaining to the child what they can see and what they're doing. So providing that language model. There's a point at which she's talking about the restaurant and he clearly isn't interested. So she picks up and moves to the green in terms of that. So responding actually to the part of the map the child's interested in. So paying attention to him and picking up what he's interested in. And I think there's a, a nice example about being really tuned into him because clearly something's happening um, in the background and he's, he has a, a moment where he's distracted and he starts to look outside and she said, would you like to go outside? Checks that he still wants to carry on with this. So she clearly knows that when he's not looking interested in this, looking out there, that might be might be what he wants to do. So um, so a really skilled role of, of, of an adult in terms of that, about responding to what the child's doing, whilst also providing providing that role model in terms of that. And so as a result, they both get a chance to lead. She's talking when she's doing it, um, but he's actually leading through his actions and she's responding to that. So some really, some really um, sensitive um, adult reaction to what a child's doing. Um, we've been through quite a lot. Um, we're coming um, up towards the end now in, in, in terms of that. So we've looked at um, the importance of adults and the key worker. We've thought about the importance of developing um, early language. We've talked about the importance of the environment. And we've talked about the importance of adult interactions and children's interactions with each other. So I think in summary, it's going back to um, what we started about. And when I said to you, the most important thing for me when we're thinking about children under three is the relationship that they have with caring, skilled adults who know how children learn. So it's about that high quality care is about positive relationships and really enabling environments. And in all of those videos, I know we focused a lot on the children at the front, but you could see what else was going in, on in the background. And you could see how enabling those, those environments were, how they thought really carefully about the resources, how they thought about how children accessed, how they thought about how young children transport resources from one place to another how there were opportunities for being physical, for climbing, for, for falling over as part of that, how the, the, the resources that had been planned were appropriate to the ages and stages of the children. So it goes back to that, that importance of adults understanding how children develop and really thinking about what's the next step for the children who are in your care and what do I need to do to support the child with the next step about have the importance of that high quality care being consistent um, and so children know what's going to happen they're starting to understand routines um, that adults are working as a team to, to support children within that that we could see in all of those videos that these practitioners really really enjoy spending time um, with young children about that understanding that sometimes um, children will be anxious, sometimes they'll get upset, sometimes they will need support managing their emotions. That's all part of, uh, of, of growing up um, and the importance of adults who support and understand that. So, and the importance of partnership with parents. So not only the, the understanding the importance of family, of parents and of home, in the life of the child and supporting them to explore those ideas when they're when they're in their setting, whether it's about talking the video we saw about talking about daddy on the phone or exploring that through through home role play as part of that. And understanding that learning environments need to be enabling in line with the ages and stages of the children. So as children move through, the, the learning environment will develop and recognising that even when children are the same age, they can be at different stages in terms of their development. So we need to think very much about the individual child and what their particular needs are. What I always say to people is um, people attend lots of training and you always leave with ideas of, oh, I'm going to do that or that and that video was brilliant. Um, one of the things that I always do is I write it in my diary. It might be for a month's time, might be for slightly longer. Um, I write down, I, I think about what it is I'm going to take away, what my next step's going to be, something that I'm going to do as a result of this. And then I write it in my diary for a month or six weeks time. Um, so when it comes up in my diary or on my phone as a reminder, it, it just prompts me to remember, did I do that? Did it work? 
Was there something else that I'd like to try as part of that? Well, thank you very much for your time. Um, I hope that you enjoyed the, um, the, the videos that we looked at and the training um, session, and I hope that you managed to take it forward and, and use it in your practice.